Good evening. Good evening, all. Welcome. My name is actually Maarten van Essa. I'm the program director of the John Adams Institute. And welcome here in the Single Kerk. We haven't been here in a very long time. Uh, and it's great to be back here. The Single Kerk is for those of you who don't know it. This is one of those famous hidden churches. Uh, like you might know, it's the Observe Hill of Solder or the Rode Hoods, uh, which were places where they could have a sermon, uh, uh, like a minority faith could have a sermon here. Uh, they were allowed by the majority faith, except that they couldn't do it in public spaces, so they built these churches behind uh, the regular street view. Uh, I'm happy to see. All you're here uh, tonight for a book which I think the events of today in London show uh, is still current uh, and unfortunately probably will stay current. Um, I hope we'll have a great discussion about Black Flags which is translated, translated into Dutch into Zwarte Vlaggen by Uitgeverij Q, uh, which is actually the first time we work, uh, with, uh, work together with and we're very happy uh, Bart Mirjam uh, that you were working with us to bring Joey Warwick here. And uh, we're looking forward for an excellent uh, discussion and talk by Joey. Um, tonight's moderator is going to be Chris Kainer. Chris has been moderating John Adams events for 20 years, something like that, a long, long time. <laughs> You've been on the board for uh, nine years up to John Adams Institute as well. and. Uh, most people know him as uh, the presenter of Bureau Buitenland, Radio 1, uh, Tolle Borg, Radio 1, and of course for your documentaries for Tegelift. Uh, please give him a warm welcome. Well, shall I stand here? I'll try it like this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, proper place to talk about a book about ISIS, I think, a church. Thank you very much. That shows how much of a radio man I am. Um, last week, after I exercised my uh, democratic privileges, I treated myself to a festive gig or two. Um, but it was definitely before the third week that I had the following conversation in a typical Amsterdam cafe just to Stones to throw away from here. Ask the woman, are you also terrified of ISIS? She said, no. She said, with all these beheadings and all this horrible violence, doesn't it scare you to death? I said, no, because their own rules have a history. They're fighting a losing battle, and in any case, they're over there, they're not here. She, but, but we had a beheading here in Amsterdam last year when they found this chopped off head in front of the seashell lounge, lounge. And I said, but that was a criminal gang war that had nothing to do with this business. No, she said, but they were Moroccans. And then I ordered a third drink, and I will confess to a fourth, and that's where my memory goes blank. Um, now, I'm not trying to say that there is no reason to be scared of ISIS, uh, especially tonight, although we don't know the specifics of what happened in London yet, that, that would be quite a statement. Um, I guess it just goes to show that I don't like to be terrified. Um, but the reason for my, my drinking that evening was, in fact, the opposite, because once more, it became clear to me how much our democratic process and the decisions people took during that Wednesday, the 15th of March, were also, were also determined by a process far away. A process that had entered its final phase exactly six years ago to that day. Because it was on the 15th of March 2011 that brave Syrians took the streets of Dara and Damascus in the first protest that started. Syrian Spring that would end up as the Syrian Civil War. And with the Syrian Civil War came ISIS, and with ISIS came the incredible cruelty and the images of that cruelty that went all over the world. And with ISIS came Charlie Hebdo and Bataclan and Brussels and probably, possibly, maybe now in London. And with ISIS 
and the Syrian civil war claimed Vladimir Putin and his bombs in addition to Russia's bombs. And with ISIS came our bombs. And with all the bombs that ISIS came, the little masses that crossed the Balkans in the fall of 2015 on their way to paradise in June. And all that, I am sure, was one determining factor in the result of our elections last week. And not only there, a few days ago I saw a survey done by Fox among Americans asking what their priorities were with regard to the Trump presidency. One was job creation, and he was defeating ISIS. All I want to say is you better know who we're talking about. So I'm very glad I was asked to stand here tonight to try and make this into an informative and a fruitful evening, because that's precisely what we're going to do tonight. Talk about ISIS, its past, its present, and its future. And with man who definitely knows what he's talking about, Joby Ward. Joby Ward's full of surprise winning book is not just a fantastic read, it's also the best in the foreign book about the history of ISIS I have read. And for what that's worse, it's my job to be about among other things, alhamdulillah. It's the story of a pet thug from a Jordanian backwater, turning into the most feared adversary of the American troops in Iraq. It's the story of the Jordanian intelligence officers who know the man from his earliest days as a radicalizing jihad, to whom no one seems to really listen to. It's the story of that bungled war in Iraq, horrified intelligence officers in the United States who see the drama unfold before their eyes without being able to do anything about it. It's the story of another bungled process, the development of the Syrian Spring into the Syrian Civil War. Not well, at least because the first bungling caused the Obama administration to hold back on real support for two guys that were definitely there in the beginning. And thus it comes the story of the heritage of that little Jordanian third. Caliphate declared by ISIS in the east of Syria and the north of Iraq. And that is how it became our story. That is why we are so glad that he is here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Joey Ward. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. We're good? You guys are tall. I mean, you're still trying to figure this out. It is a pleasure to be with uh, folks here of the Don, Don Adams Institute, and also, I must say, I'm embarrassed to say, my first time in Amsterdam. I feel like I'm well-traveled. Somehow I've managed to avoid coming here before, so I deeply apologize for that, and I can pledge to you that I'll try to make up for lost time in the next couple of days. So thank you again for this invitation. And this being an event sponsored by the John Adams Institute, I know you probably know every legend and anecdote and myth about our second president, so I won't try to compete with that. But I do have a fake John Adams story coming from the land of fake news. It's actually a Hollywood story. My favorite Hollywood representation or, or portrayal of John Adams was this HBO series that came out a few years ago called John Adams, starring Paul Giamatti. I don't know if you've seen it or if you can still see it. It's just a wonderful show. And what's great about it, other than the fact that it's just well done, is the casting. Because Paul Giamatti is not just a brilliant actor, he is the perfect John Adams. And to explain what I mean, I mean, you, you know the actor I'm speaking of. So Paul Giamatti is not your typical Hollywood leading man, shall we say. He's a little bit soft and pudgy, he's losing his hair, doesn't have some great animal charisma or a booming voice. But he has this a mastery of the small details or the, the nuances of character that can turn a mundane part or a mundane film into something really special and powerful. And John Adams was exactly that way. You think of the guy, even. It's not a bad representation of what he looked like. He was short, pudgy, bald, a bad dancer, the legend goes. He was not particularly impressive socially. People thought he was somewhat boring compared to his, his counterparts. Not the dashing general that George Washington was or the sort of the, the folksy, homespun inventor that Ben Franklin was. But he was the master at the small details at a moment of our history in the United States that we really needed this kind of, 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 of skill. Diplomacy, the ability to build alliances, negotiate loans from powerful Dutch bankers, which turned out to be quite helpful to us. It was not glamorous, but it turned out to be absolutely essential to winning independence and creating this new country. 
And this is actually a good segue to our conversation today, because it turns out that the skills and talents that John Adams possessed also offer the greatest chance for succeeding against the Islamic State. It's not bigger bombs or more drones. It's not brilliant military strategy or powerful speech making. It's the slow, difficult, decidedly unglamorous work of building alliances, bridging diplomatic divides, working with partners to address the root causes of radicalism, which is our biggest challenge here in the US and in Europe as well. I think John Adams will be proud today of the international coalition that is right now working to defeat ISIS in Mosul. He would applaud the diplomatic skill that forged that alliance three years ago, and I think he would be quite dismayed by the return of unilateralism and the divisive rhetoric that we see in the U.S. Capitol in the last few weeks. The other thing that John Adams knew very well was that you have to understand your enemy if you have any chance of defeating him. And that really is what my book is about, as Chris described. True success against the Islamic State has to begin with truly understanding the threat, where it comes from, what it seeks, what drives it, what sustains it. To, to that end, I'm going to spend a few minutes describing five personalities within the Islamic State, because these are people you need to know if you want to understand what this organization is about and how it's going to be defeated eventually. I think that will happen, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future. Their stories are illuminating and also cautionary, because they show us again and again that misguided solutions can actually make the problem worse. The wrong prescription can worsen the disease. So let's start with our five personalities. My book is really a story of origins. It's a character sketch of the individuals that built ISIS. And it starts with this very famous, now we essentially have rediscovered him in the last few years, Jordanian, whose name is Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. We start with him because he's really the most important terrorist figure in the last few decades, second only to Osama bin Laden himself. He was the founder, really, of all ISIS, the pioneer of all the tactics we see ISIS using today, from beheading young men in orange jumpsuits and the use of the internet to, to promote the cause. He was an original and indispensable force. ISIS literally would not have existed without him, and in a strange way, Sarkawi would not have existed without us and our mistakes in the West. So if you want to understand ISIS, this is the place to begin. So even a terrorist starts life as a cute little kid. So here is Zarqawi as a young boy, probably eight or so, maybe a little bit younger than that, in his hometown of Zark of Jordan. The problem was he wasn't a cute little kid. From the very beginning, this, this little guy was turning into a vicious punk and started with cutting friends at school with razor blades and proceeded to use some alcohol and drugs. By the time he was in his teens, he was a high school dropout. He was a real gangster, a thug with tattoos. Um, he was on his way to just a, tr just a troubled life. Uh, his parents got really upset. They pushed him into joining a religious group at the local mosque. And then he goes whole hog the other way, becomes a religious radical. He decides to do what a lot of other young men of his age were doing at this time, which is to go off to Afghanistan to fight the communists, to fight the Russians and their Afghan puppet government in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan. So this becomes um, a part of his transformation, but also becomes the start of the modern jihadist movement as we know it. This is where Al-Qaeda gets its start. For Zarqawi, it's paradise. It's a place where even this young man who had no prospects and was really a wash-up in his life found that he was very good at some things, like killing people. He was very brutal. He was ferocious, ferocious as a fighter. And he was part of something suddenly that was big and meaningful. A band of Muslim warriors had were fighting the great Soviet army, and they were winning. So it could only mean that Allah was on their side. And for this young man of, in his 20s, who had never done anything important in his life, this is very heady stuff. But then the war ends for him. So he goes back home to Jordan, which is a very sleepy, boring place for, for Zarqawi to go to. This is his house in Zarqawi, in Zarqawi, where he grew up. He wants to keep this jihadi thing going. He's restless, he's ambitious. So he gets his friends together and they form a little cell. They start looking for things to do, symbols of Western corruption to attack. So they start attacking bars and liquor stores, go after pornographic theaters and things like that. One of the guys in the group gets this idea to go blow up a theater that was showing X-rated pornographic movies. So he goes into the theater with his bomb, sits down, the film starts. He starts getting very engrossed in the action he forgets all about his bomb. The thing blows up his feet. He loses both his legs. And nobody else gets hurt. And these are the kind of knuckleheads that we're dealing with in Sarkali's gang in the 1990s. 
So eventually, the Jordanians realize they have a problem. They've got all these young men coming back from the, from the wars and coming home with nothing to do. This sounds somehow familiar to the situation we're in now. And so they start arresting them, they throw them in jail, and Zarqawi ends up in prison. Perhaps unwisely, and again, great parallel to the situation we see now in, in Holland and other places, the authorities decide to corral them all together because they don't want the contagion to spread. So all the jihadis are off in their own little prison so they, so they can't make mischief. But in this setting, under harsh conditions, a movement congeals and becomes more and more radical. And the prison becomes kind of a jihadi university with this young man, Zarqawi, becoming a more and more respected and capable leader. He's the tough guy. He has the street swagger. So other prisoners look up to him. So in a few years, he goes from being this vicious Jordanian street tough to a vicious convict who happens to be a combat veteran and a religious fanatic and a very dangerous guy. Fortunately for all of us, he's in prison, and he was going to be in prison for a very long time. He was sentenced to stay in there for 15 years. This is where he gets the start of a couple of really amazing breaks, turns of history that could have moved things in a different direction, but, uh, but did not. In 1999, Zarqawi is locked away, supposed to be in jail to his mid-40s. But then the king of Jordan dies. King Hussein dies in 1999. In Jordan, there's a tradition when the, when the sovereign passes away, a general amnesty is, is announced for political prisoners, essentially. A list comes together, parliament, tribes, all nominate names. Before they know it, there's 2,000 people on this list to be freed from prison. Sarkawi and his entire gang is on the list. So 1999, way ahead of schedule, he gets freed. What does he do? Well, he goes off to the one place in his life that felt like home, where he felt like he had meaning, which is Afghanistan. He wants to reunite with his old hero, Osama bin Laden. Turns out that bin Laden didn't want it. He takes one look at this crazy Jordanian kid with the wild ideas and for violent temperament. He says, you're too nuts for us. So he rejects Zarqawi, gives him some money, sends him off to another place, says, start your own camp. You're not a big part of Al-Qaeda, but you can do your own thing. So off he goes first to western Afghanistan, eventually ends up in the mountains between Iran and Iraq. But he's off on his own, again in obscurity. Nobody should have ever heard of him ever again. Second amazing turn of events in history. In February 2003, the United States is getting ready to invade Iraq. To make that incredibly provocative move, it needs to build support, it needs a coalition of support from around the world. So Secretary of State Paul Colin Powell goes to the UN Security Council to make the case for war. There are two pillars for this argument. One is that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and we know all how that went. The other pillar is that there is this possibility of collusion between Al-Qaeda, the terrorists, and Saddam Hussein, the dictator. What if those two get together? What if Al-Qaeda gets weapons of mass destruction from Hussein? A very dangerous situation, potentially. Problem is, there's not much evidence of this, but there is one interesting circumstantial case, and Colin Powell makes it. He puts this slide up. This is actually the, the image that he puts before the UN Security Council, showing this web of connections that could link Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. The young man at the top of the list is this terrorist called Abu Musab al-Sarqawi, who none of us had ever heard of. We're all, I'm working at the Washington Post at the time, we're all racing up to our computers to figure out who the heck this guy is and why is he so important. But this is the connection that the Bush administration wanted to make, that there was this possible collusion. There were two problems with the case that he made. One was that it was completely wrong, that Zarqawi had nothing to do with Saddam Hussein. They hate each other. Saddam Hussein was just as suspicious of him as, as our government was. The second problem was it elevated Zarqawi from obscurity, from being a nobody, to being somebody who was very important in the jihadi world. The Secretary of State of the United States was talking about him. So suddenly, overnight, Zarqawi starts to get money, he starts to get recruits from around the world. He is a somebody now because the U.S. made him important. And when the United States goes into Iraq to start the invasion in 2003, Zarqawi has moved himself into Baghdad to wait the American troops, not Al-Qaeda, none of these other groups that we had warned and, and worried about. It was this young nobody who moves into to Zarqawi to start this terrible chain of and he ends up being successful very quickly because even though he's not book smart, he even finished high school, he's strategically very smart. And so one of the things he does is he surrounds himself with some very important people, Iraqi army officers who no longer have a job because the Bush administration has dissolved the armed forces. They've, they've outlawed the Ba'athist party. Anybody who's important in Iraq had to be a member of the Ba'athist party. Suddenly those guys have no jobs, no pensions, and this young Jordanian hothead who's trying to do things, who's trying to start an insurgency, becomes a very important ally. So they all have common, common enemies. They, they go on the attack in 2003, and amazing things start to happen. They start going after really big targets. 
the UN headquarters in Iraq. They blow that up, kill the UN, uh, the head of the UN delegation. They go after the Red Cross. They go after embassies. They go after NGOs. Anybody who could give the American occupation the legitimacy of, you know, of some kind of legal cover gets attacked and driven away. So that's what he does very quickly and very smartly. Second thing he does is to go after the Sunni Shia fault line. As you guys know from your recent history, the Sunnis and Shia had essentially managed to get along okay under Saddam Hussein because he's a vicious dictator who didn't allow infighting between groups. But suddenly Zarqawi starts attacking Shiite shrines in their most important mosque. He starts killing their leaders and then essentially touches off a civil war, this bloody fighting that goes on with waves of reprisal killing and it just the country starts to fall apart. If you look at the, the thing in retrospect, it's a pretty smart approach because First step was isolate the United States, drive everybody else away, ignite a civil war, and put the U.S. right in the middle of it. So all sides are fighting at us, and it becomes a quagmire pretty quickly. Within a year, the small band grows to 10,000 fighters, about a third of them foreigners who travel from other places, such as Europe and, and the Gulf, just as happened more recently with ISIS. They have this terrorist army that seems to be on the verge of defeating a, a superpower. So how he becomes so successful that bin Laden finally has to look at this guy and say, wow, you're, you're winning, so I want you to be on my team. So they made Zarqawi the first franchise of, of al-Qaeda. They, they created this thing called al-Qaeda in Iraq. And that's really where the Black Flags movement begins. But Zarqawi had a very different notion of what jihad should look like. Against everybody else's advice, he adopts a peculiar brand of brutality that becomes his special trademark. He came to understand that no bombing, no shooting, no act of terrorism is as viscerally horrible to contemplate than the death of a single human being who's killed in a brutal fashion. So he takes a young American that he just happens to find, some kid from Philadelphia that he picks up off the street, puts him in the orange jumpsuit, which is evocative of Abu Ghraib and of Guantanamo and all the, the wrongs that America was committing uh, in the eyes of the Arab world. And then Zarqawi, they're reading the script, takes out a knife and with his own hand, he beheads this young man. That becomes the first of many beheadings. He puts it on the internet, just at a time when broadband internet is becoming common and popular. So this, this horrible video is downloaded millions of times. In the progress, in the, in the process, Sarkali himself becomes a sensation. So you've got gray-bearded Osama bin Laden reading sermons from a script, and now you've got this jihadi action figure in his black ninja outfit, firing a machine gun, killing Americans with his own hand. He's reinventing a kind of violent jihad that's different from any strain we'd seen before. So what are the tenets of this new kind of jihad? One is this gang makes up its own rules. As you know, Zarqawi could barely read the Quran, let alone understand complicated theology. He didn't care then what Islam says you can and can't do. It didn't bother him that you can massacre women and children in a suicide bombing because he didn't make those theological distinctions. It wasn't important to him. He starts to become more ambitious and believing in his own myth. He starts to talk about the idea of the caliphate, restoring this, this mythical Islamic holy land that had existed in centuries past. He begins to see himself as a man of destiny, someone who's not just important, but someone who will bring the earth to an apocalypse, to an Armageddon, the great end times battle in which the armies of Islam would defeat the armies of the West. And this was to be his role in history, as he saw it. I am the spark, he kept telling his leaders, his followers. Spoiler alert, he didn't get to see any of it. He ends up uh, being enemy number one for the Bush administration. We invested a lot of resources in trying to find him. It took us three years. We finally got an intelligence break. We figured out where his hideout was. And uh, bom a, a jet came by and dropped a couple of bombs on it, and he's killed. And there's optimism in, in the White House that this is the end of Zarqawi's movement, and we essentially have gotten past this terrible problem that we were dealing with in, in Iraq. But as we all know from our recent history, that wasn't the case. And that brings us to our second ISIS personality. A lot of you know the name, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who's the leader of ISIS today. And he is, in many ways, Zarqawi's opposite, but they share some important traits. So, you know, Zarqawi was the high school dropout, the street thug. Baghdadi was a nerd, a bookworm. His goal in life was to become a university professor, a scholar of Islamic law. He wasn't a fighter at all. But when the war started, he joined the insurgency because he thought, he thought it was his religious duty. As a good Muslim, you have to fight and so he joined Zarqawi's organization. He gets arrested pretty quickly, winds up in this place called Camp Buka, which is just as it appears, a big uh, warehouse for these young men in the middle of the desert where you have thousands of, of people 
locked up together behind barbed wire without any real supervision, without any program, without any rehabilitation. They're just kept there. This becomes the jihadi university on steroids. If you came in this place not being a jihadi, it's a pretty good chance you're going to be one when you left. Thanks, really, to our forces being there. So Baghdadi gets released eventually. He ends up rising in the ranks of, of Zarqawi's movement, which now calls itself the Islamic State of Iraq. They have a new name. But it's an organization that's on the brink of collapse because Zarqawi's dead. A lot of his lieutenants and, and commanders have been arrested or killed. And they're failing for a couple of interesting reasons, which are important to think about in the current context. One reason they're falling is because the, the other Muslims have turned against them. The Sunni tribes, which had briefly supported Zarqawi's organization, because they were fighting the Americans, had now gotten really tired of these jihadists and these terrorists, and so they began to fight back against them. There's this thing called the Anbar Awakening, which begins around 2007. It becomes very serious. It becomes more important to the demise of this organization than anything the Americans did. It was the, Amer the, the Iraqis themselves fighting against the terrorists. The other factor was American firepower, but it wasn't the big army in the field. It wasn't the tanks and the divisions. It was discrete use of air power. Intelligence, special forces, very small footprint. The SEALs and the Delta operators who became very, very good at fighting the terrorists in their safe houses and going after them night after night. I spent a lot of time with these guys talking about the jobs they did, and it's some of it's really amazing to hear about, and, and, and it's uh, sometimes disturbing, but they were very effective at fighting the, the terrorists and shutting down their operations. So about 2010, again, the Islamic State of Iraq appears beaten. But then fate intervenes one more time on the jihadist side. This is exactly the moment that U.S. forces are pulling out of Iraq, as they had promised to do. And by the end of 2011, they'll be completely gone. They'll be out of Iraq altogether. And once they're gone, the Americans who had helped keep order in this country are, are out of the picture. And so the, the Sunnis and Shia and Kurds are all in each other's throats. And the Sunnis are feeling repressed. They're down in the minority. And so they begin looking for anyone who can help them fight back, even the terrorists. I sat in conversation with some of these, these Sunni Iraqi chieftains who were saying, well, we'll let ISIS in, we'll help them out because they can help us fight the Maliki government. And once they're in here, we'll control them, no problem. So they let, these, let the, the terrorists essentially in through the front door. This also happens to be the precise moment in which revolutions are breaking out across the Middle East. And in, in Syria in particular, Arab Spring turns into an all-out civil war, and Baghdadi sees his opportunity. He moves his people into Syria to start their own militia group, and they have a perfect incubator now. They've got a lawless state awash in violence and weapons, and they have a new reason to exist. They're fighting the dictator. Not fighting Americans anymore, but now they've got this terrible Assad to fight. And they become extraordinarily successful almost immediately because they're battle-hardened, they're the best fighters on the rebel side, thousands of foreign recruits begin flocking to this group from around the world, and they give themselves a new name again, the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham. But what is this ISIS really? Well, it's Zarqawi's old organization with a few new twists. Zarqawi embraced violence for its own sake, to call attention, to provoke, to shock. ISIS does the same thing, but on a much grander scale, using tactics even Al-Qaeda finds disgusting. Zarqawi didn't know the Quran, so he made it his own rules. By contrast, Baghdadi, the religious scholar, goes to great lengths to try to justify what he does. So he always finds some verse in the, in the Quran or some, some tradition in the Hadith that allows him to justify these terrible acts that you see, showing that these uh, that ISIS, they're pious Muslims and not just barbarians. So this defines Baghdadi, our second character, as someone who is likes our Kali, but regimented, methodical, professional. But he also is someone who understood the power of the internet. So Kali came along understanding that horror can be amplified on a massive scale using, using communication available on the internet. ISIS takes advantage of Twitter and social media and become very, very good at it. And when you see these videos they do, it's, 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 it's not just one guy with a cell phone camera, it's teams, professionals, videographers taking the same shot from different angles and going to a studio, mixing it up, and making it slick for a generation of young people who grow up playing Call of Duty and other war games. It's all very deliberate. And so this formula works, and the idea of ISIS becomes a powerful attraction. At least 35,000 foreigners joined the ISIS army, which is far more than ever joined the Al-Qaeda's movement, or the Taliban, in Afghanistan. They quickly overrun Iraqi cities, they capture army bases, universities, factories, banks, have the kinds of resources that Al-Qaeda would only have dreamed of having. 
and the movement metastasizes. It spreads. In a year, there are many ISIS states in nine countries. And there are legions of recruits coming from, to the caliphate from the West, more than 5,000 with, with, with the European Union citizenship. These are the young men and women that we're fighting in Iraq and Syria today. And some of them, as we know, will come home, and some already have. Which brings us quickly to our next personality that defines ISIS today. Many of you will recognize Abdul Hamid Aboud as the 28-year-old Belgian who led the terrorist attack in Paris in 2015 that killed 130 people. His background turns out to be very typical for the prototype of Northern Europeans who joined ISIS. He's the son of Muslim immigrants from North Africa, a troubled youth, well-known to police. He travels to Syria and initially is a little bit upset by the bloodshed he sees, but in a few months he's posting videos of himself dragging corpses behind his car. ISIS sees an opportunity in this young terrorist with a European passport. They quickly send him back to Europe to coordinate attacks there. Paris was his biggest and final assignment, and we all know what happened there. But why did he do it? What drew this young man to join this organization and committed these acts? My colleagues and I spent a lot of time exploring Abu's story and that of his comrades. And this is some of the things we learned. For one thing, we learned that, that ISIS much prefers to recruit from prisons and street gangs than mosques, at least in Europe. Like Zarqawi in Baghdadi, he was partly radicalized in prison. And before that, he was a petty criminal who was in and out of jail. He was not a pious Muslim. He was not a religious radical. He was a radical who became religious. And this is the common pattern with ISIS, and it reflects the criminal roots of their leaders and the criminal nature of the enterprise. European investigators tell us that prisons are a special concern. Within many of these prisons, we see this subculture of violent, hardcore jihadists. The subculture has its own codes, special ways to dress, special ways to speak and to cut your hair. It's a gang. It's very much like the Crips and the Bloods we have in Los Angeles, these violent gangs that essentially be form, form in prison and then spread out to society. Or they're like some of the white supremacist groups we have in, in my country that surround themselves with religious symbols and extremist theology, but it's really about hatred and violence. Governments are just beginning to grapple with the problem of how to deal with these, these gangs. And it's hardly news to people in this room, but favorable conditions for recruitment exist outside prisons as well, in places where young men and young women grow up in, a, in an urban underclass that is neither fully European nor traditionally Muslim. Here, too, the appeal is more social than religious, investigators tell us. The typical recruit is not, again, a pious Muslim. He's a street punk. Like Abu, he doesn't care about the nuances of theology. He wants to be in the gang. He wants to be a tough guy, to have an adventure, a purpose. And ISIS offers all this and more. And there's even a bigger prize here for ISIS, and it's the hearts and minds of Abu's family and friends. Perversely, one of the primary reasons for the terrorist attacks we see in Europe, including perhaps the one today, we'll have to wait and see, is we, we know why they do it from their own statements. When it sends terrorists to places like France, it's not looking to achieve some kind of military victory. It doesn't think it's going to shut down French society or even force the French to withdraw its forces from the coalition in Iraq. What ISIS can accomplish is to drive a bigger wedge between French Muslims and everybody else. Ordinary citizens will look fearfully at Muslims, all Muslims. The government will be under pressure to crack down on Muslims in general, to round up suspects, to harass Muslim teenagers, to search their houses and spy on their mosques. And when this happens, how will these 7 million Muslims in France respond? Well, they'll be forced to choose sides in ISIS's thinking. And that's precisely what ISIS wants. We know this because just before the tragedy in Paris, ISIS's English language magazine called The Beak put out an article warning that the attack was coming and saying explicitly why. ISIS says it's methodically going after what it calls the Muslim gray zone in Europe, the millions of Muslims who straddle two worlds and forcing them to choose sides. If terrorist attacks inspire a backlash against ordinary Muslims, the choice becomes clearer in their view. Muslims in the West, quoting ISIS here, will quickly find themselves between one of two choices. They either apostatize and adopt the infidel religion, or they emigrate to the Islamic State. So our fourth personality was never a member of ISIS at all, and yet in the United States we all associate Omar Mateen with the Islamic State. This is the young man that walked into a nightclub in Orlando, Florida last summer and killed 49 people in the worst mass shooting in U.S. history, which is saying a lot because he's had some terrible ones. This is what America's ISIS problem looks like, and it's quite different. Those of us who covered the events, as I do, will never forget that day and how this troubled man walked into this nightclub and began calmly killing people in a spree that lasted for hours. But Tina at one point gets on the phone with police and he claims he did it for ISIS. To date, there's no evidence that ISIS had anything to do with this. In fact, in Mateen's statements, you see a real convoluted 
understanding and mixes up ISIS with other groups and really doesn't really have a real grasp of what ISIS is all about. Some experts will say about young men like Mateen that they were inspired by ISIS. I like to think it's more accurate to say that they use ISIS for an excuse. And what I mean by that is, is this. When you look at the background of someone like Omar Mateen, you see they look a lot like the perpetrators of almost all the other Islamist terrorist attacks that have taken place in the United States. He's an American citizen. He's not an immigrant. He's the son of immigrants, some who grew up and looks and talks and acts like the rest of us. His ambition in life was to be a police officer. He wasn't religious at all, quite far from it. He began to radicalize after his life began falling apart. He had emotional problems and violent tendencies. He had a grudge against society because his life wasn't working out like he planned. And in fact, if you look closely, you'll see that Mateen is not that different from another high-profile killer we had in the United States recently. This is the young man Dylan Roof, who was the boy that walked into a church in South Carolina and shot nine worshippers and killed them just a few months ago. He had the same profile exactly, the troubled young man in his 20s with a grudge against the world, as well as a boastfulness and a craving for attention. Roof blamed African Americans for the failures in his life. Mateen and some of these other uh, terrorist suspects became fascinated with jihadi literature and, and violence they saw on the internet. And they used ISIS as a way of just, uh, justifying their actions as tied to a great cause, and not just some monstrous act of self-pity. Now, I highlight this because it ties into the debate we're having, at least in my country, I know to some extent you're having it here too, where the Trump administration announced its travel ban a few months ago, affecting seven majority Muslim countries. The most vehement reaction I heard anywhere was from longtime sources in the intelligence community, people who have spent their careers trying to prevent terrorist attacks on the homeland. And the consensus was that the ban, no matter what its initial justification, just accomplished nothing as a practical matter because it does not address the biggest terrorist threat, which is homegrown radicalization. It instead can actually make the threat worse by creating a perception that the U.S. government is at war with Islam. And, and that perception is enorm enormously helpful to ISIS. It explains why ISIS has been using the travel ban and its propaganda for the last few weeks. ISIS is whispering in the ears of young men like Omar Mateen saying, your government hates you. It hates all Muslims, and here's your proof. You should stand with us. The fifth and final personality I want to introduce is, is probably the most disturbing of all, even though he's only eight years old. His name is Taim, and we met him last year in a refugee camp just a few hours' drive from here. He's one of tens of thousands, really perhaps hundreds of thousands, of young children who have lived under ISIS in the towns and villages of the Caliphate. He's a bright, beautiful young boy who happened to live in the Syrian city of Raqqa when ISIS took over. Within months, he was in an ISIS training camp, learning how to shoot a gun, taught that his parents are bad Muslims and he should report on their, their un-Islamic behavior. He was taught that the greatest possible calling for a young boy like himself was to be a suicide bomber. Time told us about witnessing executions. He told us about going to the local park and finding the bodies of men with their severed heads stacked up next to them. Every now and then during an interview, he would shut down and become fidgety. And at one point, he asked us for a, a pen and a piece of paper so he just would start drawing. And this is the actual picture that he drew. It was a scene that he had witnessed in his town square. The men from ISIS had a prisoner, a one-eyed man, who had been taken to the town square for punishment. Taim's next drawing was of the one-eyed man's head, now severed and on the ground. Taim told his story to us this way. He said, the other man has no eye. They had already taken his eye, you see. And then the other men stood behind him, and the head of the man with one eye just fell. He pointed to show us. His head just fell, he repeated. Then he closed his eyes as if to make the image go away. No, he said finally, I don't want to remember it. We worry about ISIS recruits, about people being radicalized on the internet or traveling to Iraq and Syria to fight. We're facing an entirely different problem with a generation of young people who grew up under this terror. Now bring it up because when the caliphate collapses, as it will, we in the West will be tempted to walk away, as we normally do. But there are costs for us in doing so, as Time's story made so clear to me. After our meeting, I had to ask myself, who's going to provide psychological counseling for this young man so he can begin to, to put his life back together? Who's going to rebuild his city and his school? Who's going to give hope for an economy where he can someday have a family with a job and a future? It's overwhelming to think about the size of the task, but there are good reasons, and in fact, selfish reasons to take it seriously. Because we don't find a way to address this problem, you can be assured that we'll be hearing from young boys and girls like Taim in the future. You can be confident that the kind of extremism and brutality that we've witnessed in the last few years will come back to haunt us again. With that, I want to thank you for your time and your attention. I'm happy to take a few questions.
there's absolutely a sense of, of provocation with some of these acts because I know that there is this sense of being purists, you're not allowed to have images, you know, they don't respect the, sort of the symbolism and the, and the creations of past civilizations that weren't that were pre Islamic in particular. But there is also this, this, this sense that ISIS wants to provoke. I think it's the reason that you see these really barbaric scenes. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about attracting recruits. It's about horrifying the rest of us, making us very afraid of them, making us respect them in some perverse way, making us all very afraid. And it's worked. I, you know, we just we were talking just a moment ago, this is talking about the, the fact that in our country, uh, when you ask people, posters, ask, ask people why they voted for Donald Trump, ISIS comes up again and again, and, it, and ISIS has never carried out a successful attack on U.S. soil. There have been people who blame ISIS for various things, but ISIS has never managed to plan their own attack. And yet, people in the heartland are afraid. People in little rural towns and little Midwest are just convinced that ISIS is at the shopping center next door, and they're going to blow something up at McDonald's next week. And so you do have this, this sense of being, people being very unsettled and wanting solutions, wanting somebody to do something very tough, even if there's no real plan, they just want something done. And I think this has all been part of a very deliberate strategy on ISIS's part to provoke and really scare the hell out of all of us. Really. And that's exactly what they do these things to do. Our major thing, this is never at all. I, I was just take it from, from where we are now, and we'll see how it goes. If you have a very uh, pressing question, you just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll get to you. Um, can you describe this, that, that in fact, uh, the most important element of the ISIS strategy now is to scare the hell out of us and to, to drive a wedge between our Muslim communities and, and the rest of our populations here in Europe and maybe in the US? How did that evolve? Because your book is uh, for, for, let's say, about was that his original idea? Uh, how much is left of the idea of, of uh, establishing a caliphate? And how much is just aimed at creating terror and driving a wedge between us and our Muslim fellow countries? Yeah. I think it's become more of a model in, in recent years. But the, the, the original Zarqawi vision was just to kind of create this caliphate and essentially by you know, declare it and it will come. That if you, if you plant a flag, that first of all, Allah will be on your side, and be blessed by God, the people will rally around you, the Muslim world will unite around you. That's a very powerful idea. And some of these later uh, issues, even with, with, with the foreign terrorist attack, that was not initially part of Zarqawi's driving vision. He did carry out one significant overseas attack, which was in the Jewish country of Jordan, but he didn't seem to have an agenda of attacking European capital. I think that's something that evolved as ISIS became more and more under pressure. The more they began to squeeze them, the more they felt compelled to show that they're still relevant, that they're still powerful, even though they're losing their allies. And so you see, you see a shift in their tactics to, to be much more outward focused in a way that ISIS never was traditionally. Really, when they first developed, the reason for lack of panic or real lack of concern in the US administration was we didn't think they were going to be an international threat. We thought this was going to be this is a problem in Syria and Iraq. And that if we kind of let them fight it out and then kind of sit on the sidelines and let you know, nature take care of this problem, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. It turned out to be quite wrong. And so we are all now turned to pass the which, which is which is then partly due uh, to our success in fighting them. That is true. That is true. Which, which makes you worry as this caliphate begins to shrink and shrink and shrink. And now it's something like the 35% of So what is their response to that going to be? Their capabilities will be limited because they don't have sanctuary anymore in which to plan and carry out significant attacks. But they're certainly going to be under pressure to do something. Even small things like getting in a car and driving into people outside Parliament Building. That's the kind of thing I think we're going to see more. So, so uh, we'll, we'll get back to the future of the analysis. And, and, uh, but taking a little step back, you, know, you, you described how basis of ISIS uh, was al Qaeda in Iraq and how it grew on, on uh, the Sunni frustration with uh, first the Americans and then, and then the Shia government of the Islamic. Um, and, and for the organization.
motivation is founded in the lampsable to what is founded by former parties. Opposite. We were not known for their policies. And whose only problem was actually to have the rule in the Sunni triangle at least. So as for the organization, when the goals shifted in the way you just described, how did the organization Change. Is it still the old Baathists who are so important in ISIS, or has there been someone? I think they are still very important, but now there's all these other elements as well, because you've had this influx of fighters from abroad, Chechens and others who have their own agendas, and so that original intent, I think, has been watered down a bit. And there are also separate organizations in Syria and Iraq. You see the Iraqi branch of ISIS being much more concerned with the Iraqi issues and with defending the rights of Sunnis and tribal Sunnis and Anbar Khalids. Whereas Syria, the Syrian operation seems to be a bit more international in its focus because it's made up more of characters from around the world. So in that sense, because it's an organic thing and it's it's evolved in its leadership, you see sort of actually some controversy within the organization with some of the old school not really appreciating what some of the newcomers are doing and there's some tension with it. You you touched upon it. Now, in, in, in the book, you, somewhere you say that, that ISIS uh, was formed by Arab jails and American jets. Um, you describe some of the Arab jails, and you show one, which was the Bayou jail, where Azhar uh, was locked up and was a, a young radicalizing Catholic Turk. And you have talked extensively to the Iranian uh, intelligence officers who were following. I wonder, because you, you write about them as though you are a city people, I don't know, so that could be very right, but I guess there is talking about jihad in the university, prisons of jihad in the university, I guess there is some, some um, physical coercion, so to speak, going on in these jails. You don't talk about that in the book or with these intelligence officers. Well, play a role, the whole oppressiveness of the regimes in the Arab world and that element too could play a role in the prisons, prisons being in Jihadi University. Why didn't you talk about that? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a fair question. And part of this is because we do talk generally about this very repressive environment. It certainly was harsh. And at the very least, they were deprived of a proper diet. They were, they were crowded into small facilities without either air conditioned the summer, so things would go awful. And there are stories that we had difficulty confirming and the Jordanians flatly denied about people having fingernails direct ripped out and other kinds of real severe physical abuse. And the, the Jihadis, Jim Jaffa himself, would later complain about their mistreatment uh, in, in Jordanian prison. So it's, it's very much possible that it happened to them. And it's certainly the case that other famous Jihadis, such as Zawahiri, the, the leader of Al-Qaeda today, he searched his, his Enthusiasm for the cause came mostly out of the fact that he was really tortured and severely abused in Egyptian prisons, and that's as far as to say to prove it. And so the, this has been sort of the tactic uh, by Arab regimes, uh, and, and not just Arabs, but the entire part of the world, for keeping a lid on these movements they don't like is by locking people up, sometimes killing them, and often torturing. And that certainly adds to to the radicalization. You have people who weren't very violent when they went into prison coming out being much more radical and much more crazy. And so that you can't understate the effect of that. And how, how is that now? You describe that, that horrible killing of the Jordanian pilot who was the third alive in the, in the cage, the way you remember that on the stage, as, as a turning point as for level of sympathy that ISIS had in, in the Arab world, but you also say that there is still a, a very large group of young people in the Arab world that, in spite of that violence, find find the oppression by the, by the existing regime more important and are still attracted to ISIS. How is that developing? What do you see happening? Yeah. You know, we, we see contradictory trends. Um, the, poll, the polling that we see, we always have to be a little bit suspicious of, of polling that comes from that part of the world because we're not always sure that people will speak honestly to the culture. We do see evidence that support for ISIS uh, 
as a political ideology, it certainly is as the tactics that are used, it's going down and down and down. In some cases, it's, it's, it's statistically zero in countries like Lebanon. When you ask the question, do you support ISIS? People say absolutely not. But we do see that despite the depravity, despite even the killing of this pilot, a good Sunni tribesman from Jordan, in the country of Jordan, there is this, this Sunni uh, Saudi revival that is ongoing and it continues to threaten the stability of that country. So the Jordanians are very worried about high levels of support or at least significant levels of support among young Jordanians who should know better because they can take around the middle and see what's happening next door. They still see some, they show some admiration and some support for the, the, the people who are running around there right now. As for the Americans, I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with one. Because it was that series of decisions, beginning with the invasion to continue with the really mishandled occupation, that was the original sin. And if you could, could you eliminate that, you probably wouldn't have a dishonest state of the Iraq and the Shah. There would have been some other insurgency, there was certainly bad things that would have happened, but this particular gang got to start because of decisions that were made by the US government. Did you try to talk to any of that, 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 that tribe? Is that it? The, the more conservative tribe. Rumsfeld, Cheney, Abrams, Fife, uh, Wolfowitz. Except for the real, it's, it, the real hard cases, who just move managers anymore. The ones in that second level, who are sort of deputies to Powell and others who were in senior levels of government at the time, they, they not own up to the fact that this was a bundle. This was a strategic bundle. They'll, they'll blame the other forces that the CIA gave them bad intelligence. So Rumsfeld was pushing hard and couldn't resist it. Colin Powell's people who I've talked to quite a bit described their effort to try to get the intelligence right. And they went to the CIA to just to meet with the, the analysts to try to get the correct information. And they, to this day, blame the, the, the agency for not giving a good credible account of what was really going on. But there is, there's always blame shifting, but I think almost everybody who's a significant player realizes this was a huge mistake. So the things that they did, in a way, you, you pointed at the special forces who were, who were hunting into the battle and who fought him. Um, one of them was Mike Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we heard of quite recently. Uh, we, we, we tend to look at him as a loose cannon, uh, maybe a Russian spy. Some of them have case. Uh, that's not the only thing. Well, it's part of the, the evolution of Mike Flynn has been that he was regarded. Highly as a second in command, that when he was the lieutenant to Stanley McChrystal, who was running special forces in Iraq in the, in the mid 2000s, he was seen as a, a very smart tactician who could get things done. He was not the big thinker, he was not the guy who was looking at the big picture and what we should do about uh, you know, you know, this, uh, this lawless movement, because he had his own very strong views about that, even back in those days. But he was very effective at getting things done. For that reason, he got respect and, and was somebody that I interviewed many times and we could talk to. Were you surprised by his recent development? It wasn't, I don't think two things on that. One is that I knew he had some of these beliefs and that they would always pop up and he would go off the record and he would talk a little bit about his personal views. He had some, some views that were off the mainstream, shall we say. It didn't seem to interfere with his effectiveness as a military officer, but it was just a personal view that he had. He ends up rising to a high level and becomes the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And as a senior leader, if someone has his own organization to run, then he gets into problems and we start to hear stories about how he's not, uh, his temperament is not at all suited to lead an organization, that his personal beliefs do get interfered with his work. So by the time he's uh, recruited by the Trump administration or the Trump campaign to be an advisor, people were quite concerned about the potential of the But they were so good.
always learning the lessons of the last conflict and misapplying them to the, to the next one that's coming. And that just seems to be the, the, the eternal pattern. And by the time the Iraq war was lining down, okay. By the time the Iraq conflict was, was, was lining down, folks in the, the Obama administration could not get to the exit door quickly enough. They were tired of spending vast amounts of resources and energy in what seemed to be a perpetually losing conflict. They couldn't control Maliki, and Maliki was doing dangerous and stupid things. So we were just, you know, very glad not to negotiate a status of forces agreement with the Iraqis that would let us stay. We wanted to get out of there as quickly as we could. And once we were out, our ability to influence events evaporated. So we could look at silent power. We could even collaborate and coordinate our efforts with, with Iraqi intelligence because we just weren't talking to them anymore. And so that situation fell apart amazingly quickly. Being sort of manageable, you know, what looked to be a steady path toward something, maybe not a Jeff Sony democracy, but at least to stability, fell apart in, in remarkably short time. And then the, the next chapter is uh, the beginning of the Syrian uh, civil war, when the Republic is the Syrian extreme, where we have a fantastic figure in there from your book, and I don't know how many years ago, ago during the Syrian conflict, where they scored the then come uh, American ambassador to Damascus, who begged Washington to support uh, the first demonstrators and, and after the conflict in violence, the, the FSA of the Syrian army, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't listened to. Um, is that as big a missed opportunity as, as people say? Could it have prevented what happened? Yeah. One of the things being nice is what it is now. If, uh, if Barack Obama was sitting here, I think I can confidently say this because we, we know what he was what he was articulating at the time, he said it would not have made a difference. That giving weapons to a few lightly armed moderates without really military experience uh, who were opposed by a arm backed by Russia and Iran, we could not have won the day by giving you know it's like arming these moderate rebels. But the, the reality is, we'll never know the answer to that. Hillary Clinton felt the other way. She felt that we could create a good fly zone, that we could help people who were appeared to be you know, of good intention and, and arm them and support them in, in perhaps aggressive ways. Essentially, with the objective being to eliminate this horrible vacuum, this lawless vacuum that Syria had become, that allowed all these groups to spring up out of nowhere. And she believed that, as Leon Panetta, the defense secretary at the time, all argued this. The contrary argument from Barack Obama sitting in the Oval Office was, show me a time that we've got involved as Americans in supporting insurgency where it's turned out good. And that was the argument that just couldn't be shot. Nobody could come up with an answer to that. Now, um, what you said about the United refugee camp, we're living under ISIS rule, of course, where it's about two million kids in Syria, haven't had any education for the last four or five years. Our priority, the West's priority, uh, almost exclusively is fighting ISIS. Yeah. And we can't forget about the rest of Syria, because the Middle East remains suffering from Syrian war for many, many years. Um, is that the next mistake we're making? You know, for the longest time, the Obama administration, and particularly under John Kerry, there was this vision of a Deal, the deal that's going to solve all the problems. We're going to resolve the Syrian conflict. We're going to have a strategy for defeating ISIS. We're going to get all this done. And we kept going to the map and trying to make that happen. And we kept being frustrated for various reasons, mostly because the Russians would not participate or cooperate in any way. And so eventually that has fallen apart. And so instead of having this grand vision, we've broken it down into component parts. One part being let's defeat ISIS by any means possible. If God knows what's going to come after, because we really don't know what comes after that. Who's going to win Morocco? We have no idea. If it's the Kurds will probably be in control of the beginning. That's not a sustainable situation for the Turks, so that's not going to last. If the uh, Kurdish government in that part of Syria is not going to be supported by Sunnis or Shia, so we don't really have the answers to that part two and part three. So all we have now is one fight that we're trying to, to prevail on, and that's the fight against ISIS. We'll probably win it, but are we going to have a, a real victory, or is it just going to be? Part one of, of an endless series of conflicts. Because thinking about that, the 
also maybe take one uh, one time or maybe take two or three and it will take so, a few weeks inshallah. Uh, the <laughs> One is that those little mini caliphates, they're real. And some are even more serious than others. And we've looked at several of them. There's one in West Africa that looks pretty significant. There's one in the Philippines that seems to be getting stronger by the day. All of them have the same vision that we're going to create this righteous caliphate. And if it doesn't exist in Iraq and Syria anymore, it'll exist here instead. So it's like a shell game that just keeps moving around. The other thing is that even after the death of the caliphate in Iraq and Syria, that the idea has life, and that people will continue to look back at this thing that we built and that they are that traitors took away from us that we have to continue to fight for. So then it becomes a cause that almost becomes more powerful and more permanent than the caliphate itself. So this is, you know, I hate to say this, this becomes a, a very long struggle. After 9-11, I don't think any of us thought that 15 years later we'd still be talking about Al Qaeda as we're doing today. So this is really it's, it's one of the big struggles of our I think it's going to go away easily or lightly, it's just it's fooling ourselves. The only thing that we have to remember is that we have to be patient and thoughtful. If bad things will happen, but that doesn't mean we fly off the handle and do something extreme. Because the extreme measures, so the, if, if you go after a, a problem with a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel, as, as perhaps is if you wanted, you literally can make the problem much, much worse. And we've seen that in our own Could you elaborate a little bit? Little bit about that more. I mean, what are, given the, the characteristics of the guys you, uh, you just described, I mean, uh, their, their, uh, their origin in, uh, in petty crime, uh, often uh, prison, being their, their school, uh, the effect, the idea that they're joining a club, uh, the sense of belonging to a cause, to a club. So, what are the most important lessons for us here to deal with our own? Uh, ISIS members or the ones coming back before ISIS has been defeated in what? Yeah. We're just starting to look at this problem in the United States. I think you and here in Europe are ahead of us in, in some of this. But there's a realization that's dawned on our leaders, at least this month, in the last few years, is that we don't have a strategy for dealing with radicalization in the community. And it shouldn't be a law enforcement strategy because if it's gotten that far, then we're probably too late. What we need to do is, is to be able to engage local community organizations, everything from social workers to imams to prison parole officers. There's all kinds of places in the system where you can identify problem areas, identify problem people, and try to start working with them before they do something like run over a crowd with a car. And that's something that's completely missing from the, from the U.S. strategy right now. And in, in Europe, I think you're ahead of us, but you're also realizing that it's a very big problem. What do you do with 120 returnees from the Islamic State who just come back from Belgium, or the 40 or so that are back from in this country? So what do you do? do, you, do? Well, you could lock them up, and that seems to be the reflexive move. But if you lock them up and confine them together, are they only going to become more radical? Eventually, they all get out. So, so there has to be a sophisticated, long-term prop project. And I can't begin to tell you what all the props should be, but it, it can't just be, let's lock them up. Anybody in the audience? And I apologize for skipping this. No, 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 that's okay. Just the fantasy that was heard. Any point you have in mind? Because I think you walk around. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 You talk into the mic. I did get the sense that you were somewhat optimistic this was going to end. And you made a few comments saying we will win or something to that effect. But you also alluded to the fact that it might not just be a military solution. You were referring to John Adams that suggested diplomatic. But then when you look at the region that you had on the map, you're talking about a region that has one of the highest youth unemployment anywhere in the world. So 
I must confess that one, one character flaw of mine is this combat optimism that I can't uh, get seem to suppress sometimes. But I, I do believe that we as a human race are on, on a march upward and that, that, that things do improve over time. And even after setbacks, as we've had in my country in the last few months, that, that uh, the good guys eventually do win and hope maybe take something. I think the thing that is looks to be within sight is the elimination of the that's going to happen fairly quickly. And that is a good thing. You can't understate the fact that, that oh, depriving the Islamic State of a place in which they have free reign to do whatever they want to do, including develop new weapons, raise money, train recruits. There's a lot of suspicion. There's just in the last couple of days, there's been a ban on carrying laptops on planes from certain countries. And what's driving that is specific intelligence suggesting that somebody has figured out a way to put bomb to a laptop and it still have it operate. So it still looks like a laptop and you can turn it on, but it has a bomb inside of it. So capabilities are being developed and they can be developed in places where there's almost unlimited resource for these people to, to do the things they do. And up until recently, the resources available to the Islamic State were just extraordinary. I mean, just having whole army bases filled with US hardware and having whole bank accounts full of hundreds of millions of dollars of hard currency and you weigh that against the fact that it probably costs ten or twenty thousand dollars to carry off carry off a Paris operation in It doesn't take a lot of resources. They had more money than they could spend. And so we can't allow that to happen indefinitely because that is extremely dangerous. So that part we hope is going to be settled in the fairly near future. Then we have to worry about other calories in other parts of the world, but this is this is the big concern right now. The other I, don't, I, I am optimistic, but this is a very long-term view because I think what's happening in the Islamic world is, is there is a struggle underway right now for the heart and soul of a, of a major religion. We, in Europe and in, in the West, we had our Reformation and we had this generations-long fight over the role of religion in society and, and separation of church and state. It's very bloody and very complicated. I think the Islamic you know, faith is having that revolution right now. It's being torn by various sides, and there are some courageous people who are, who are speaking out and trying to claim the middle ground for, for this faith. But it's much harder to do to, than it is for us. I think that it's, this has to be something they have to solve, and we can't solve for them. In fact, it was uh, the Egyptian leader, General Al Sisi, who openly asked for uh, an Islamic reformation. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he doesn't have those there too, because he's, he's a very impressive authoritarian leader. But he asks for that development. That's, yeah. that's complicated. And it's hard for him to dictate because he doesn't have credibility with a lot of people that are fighting with him. But part of his vision, and you see this, uh, the Jordanians are involved in this as well, knowing that you know this is not a hierarchical religion. It's not like the Catholic Church where there's a pope who sets all the rules and everybody has to follow it. It's much more democratic than that. But you need to have leadership from the seminary or from their theological uh, institutions on down to local mosques in which, which imams are, are educated about you know, these things that they should all have in common, which you, you don't kill innocents, you, you, that, that you're not allowed to, to, to declare someone an apostate just because you don't agree with them. These are fundamental things that, we really, that people in the religion disagree over and you need somebody to take charge and, and try to Kind of at least be a driving force for positive change. Over there, ladies first, I want to forget you. Can you say who you are? Um, my name is Sharon, and I work with Medicines on Frontier. Um, you alluded to um, Africa and to Libya. So it was just maybe if you could talk a bit more about um, maybe Boko Haram, yeah. Libya, Yemen, um, Philippines, yeah. and, and sort of those links. Um, and yeah, how you saw them, ISIS is. Yeah. So it's interesting because you see in each of those places you mentioned, typically what's happened is there was a pre existing group that was already there that decided they wanted to be part of the caliphate. And so they latched on to ISIS mothership in Iraq, and they want to be little mini states. In some cases, it's become a very serious attempt to become like ISIS in Iraq. When I think about in particular, 
is in, in West Africa, Boko Haram, which now has two branches. There's the old Boko Haram, which is considered, you know, they're, they're outcasts, they're last, yesterday's Islamist party. And there's this new thing called the Islamic State of West Africa, which styles itself exactly like Raqqa, you know, ISIS and Raqqa, down to coordinating their video propaganda to make it look just like the stuff coming out of the caliphate. They're, they're, they're teaching their theology, their recruitment, their training. It's, it's very much in coordination with, with the mothership. So you see that example, and then you have others in places like the Philippines, which seems to be much more organic and much less controlled, but very serious. And then this latching onto the idea of the Islamic Caliphate as an excuse for some pretty atrocious behavior and just awful stuff coming out of the Philippines just now. So this is organizational ties that you know There are in some cases. We know that in particular this, this West African branch, there's a lot of communication that appears to be going on. We know that because of intelligence intercepts, and we know that just because of their behavior. Other examples are a little, it's a little less clear if they're actually communicating with, with ISIS proper or not. But at least in some cases they are, and that makes them more dangerous because they really are true satellites of, of the of the mother. If there's anybody else, please line up behind the microphone so we can see something. Uh, my name is Pierre. I have a question. I've read your book um, and I found another page and uh, um, CNN uh, had an investigation report last week. Uh, about the figure of he was interrogated uh, after the Abu uh, Ghraib uh, arrest was of the Americans, they had that prison. Uh, the interrogations afterwards, uh, what happened there, were a little bit soft. So, people, uh, investigators were asked to. So, uh, a lot of people uh, were, uh, uh, yes, sentenced, uh, uh, more soft, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, one of them was, uh, was um, a tab. Uh, it's now the prime suspect of the uh, last year of uh, assassination, now one year after. Belgium. Uh, Can you please come to the question? Because yeah, that's a worry. Okay. Um, I think that uh, governments have to be a little bit tougher in Paris uh, because the Belgians still live in a lot of places. Uh, the government passport, etc., et that dies on the loose. He's free. Yeah. What should we do here in Europe? Could be your third book. What could we do to catch them all here? Good, good question, and a complicated one, as you, as you alluded to. I, all I can offer, and obviously, as a, as, a, as a general said, I tend to be sometimes more an observer in asking questions rather than trying to prescribe solutions. But one thing I, I do believe is that whatever the law enforcement solution is has to be within the laws of a society that is bound by rules. Because we, we can handle criminal cases, we've got all kinds of ways of dealing with, with criminal suspects, but when we betray our own laws as a society, then we lose the, we're losing the heart and soul. And I can say this because of, I'm a citizen of a country that, against all our principles as a, as a democratic society, opened black prisons in foreign countries where we would put suspects and they would disappear off the map and were tortured, we know, in some cases. And, and the thing that we've learned from that, and I've talked to people who are in these prisons who are doing the interrogating, that the harsh tactic, tactics did not succeed in getting useful information out of these guys. And what they did do instead was create a great big propaganda tool for the other side to use and say, look at the Americans, they're just as bad as anybody else, so they're not really honest about their, their democratic virtues and values. So that's one thing I've, I've learned. And also just to say that that we will never be able to stop every bad guy from doing something terrible, no matter what 
what we do. Some people are just incorrigible, and I think it's certainly the case for some of these hardcore Jihadi guys. There's no amount of prison time, there's no amount of, 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 of re education or rehabilitation that's really going to make a difference. And that's why we have something like 20 guys in Guantanamo that we just don't know what to do with. Obama wanted pretty desperately to let them go, but we're not let them go, but we need to find some other solution other than keeping them in Cuba because it's extremely expensive and it's a, it's a propaganda tool for the other side. But we know these guys that they will never change. The minute we let them out, they're still all with us. We can't charge them in the legal process now because we've tortured some of them. So any evidence we use in a criminal case would be inadmissible. So we're stuck with this crazy situation where we have people who are being held by our government outside legal norms, and we can't let them go, and we can't prosecute them in a traditional sense, and we're really in a jam with them. So all I can say is that whatever we do, if societies can decide to be quite harsh, they can send people to life in prison or whatever means it seems appropriate for the crime. But we do have to honor our, our, our codes and our, our civil procedures because if we don't, then we're just losing our, our soul and who we are as, as, as democratic societies. My view. Yep. What is that? That is a quite a good question. And I have a kind of a strange personal history in my reporting career because I was once an environmental journalist and my first bills back in the 90s was for environmental projects. So I care very deeply about these issues on a personal level. And it, it is, first of all, no exaggeration to say that climate change or at least harsh climatic conditions were a factor in producing the problems we have in Syria right now. There was this epic drought that took place a few years before Arab Spring where you have literally hundreds of thousands of people being dislocated by drought and by just sort of destruction of the farm economy. And a lot of those guys moved into homes and to Aleppo and they became part of the tender that was ignited in the city. That's funny. But even more dramatically in the future is the prospect of large dislocations of, of human beings. In, the, in Iran right now, we see a country that is facing epic drought, and that is it's going to, to it's, it's going to cause refugee crises. It's going to cause people to become impoverished. We're seeing it in so many places around the world. It's only going to get worse if we stay on the track we're on. So, you know, as part of a grand solution for this problem, you can't ignore things like climate, even though they're long term and it's hard to see the day to day effects. This is something that affects the stability of whole parts of the world. And it has to be something we take seriously. And I'm afraid that my own government's case, we're, we've decided that with this new administration, we're just going to forget about it entirely. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little more about the And it's one that, that responsible publications, and I, I hope that we are the Washington Post, we think about this. Every time there's a terrorist attack, every time there's this, some of these terrible videos that are posted, there's a discussion in my newsroom. What is a responsible course of reporting this? We feel that people obviously need to know what's happening. Big events in our community. And there's a, somebody who tries to run down pedestrians outside Parliament. I mean, that's something that we need to report on. We need to figure out what it's about. But there also need to be restraint in what we say and in not just using and allowing these, these attacks to be used as propaganda for a, a side that wants to get maximum publicity out of these things. Because they really do. This is part of why they do it. They want to be recognized. They want people to be afraid. So we, we need to report it responsibly, but at the same time, certainly not glamorize what we're doing and try to show some restraint in our language. There's lots of talk about what kinds of General sense of caution is trying to report it is three different stories. And how are we doing in general? You know, because it's because it's all over the map when we talk about media these days, and there is no such thing as this model of fake media in my own country. We have fake news and we have um, oh, media. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there is no fake news, and that's 
part of our, and that is a, individuals who deliberately create false stories and propagate them on social media, either to, to drive clicks, if you need to pay for that, or to, to influence the kind of some more sinister cases. But I think, I must say, that I, I think there is a careful balance on most of the mainstream press that I'm familiar with, the people that I deal with every day, that we try not to over sensationalize, but it's just because the subject's impossible to, to say we do it successfully. So I was wondering what the role of Turkey and ISIS is. The second question, you have a lot of context in the intelligence community, and I was wondering what the president administration in the way it seems to also disregard or have sort of disdain for the intelligence community. What are you hearing from them about the Turkey and ISIS? That's the question. And we've, we've seen, you know, and because I, I, I do talk to these people all the time, there is a sense of dismay Scripts, I think it's not overstating it. And people in the intelligence community who work on counterterrorism, that this is an administration that, that doesn't respect their reporting, doesn't respect the products that they're generating, the intelligence reports, which often the commander chief is not even looking at on a given day, and filtering it through other means, you know, where you get this information from Breitbart News or Fox News instead of from this. Daily news, which the presidents typically or traditionally don't. Not being objective. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's what we're told by people who, uh, who, who are producing these products that are frustrated because they're, they're not being you know, paid attention to seriously. It's also a problem when you have a leader who disparages the intelligence community whenever it, it disagrees with them. Instead of just saying, well, this is, there's this other view out here and I respect it and these are professionals so we're working. To help make our country stronger, to say that because it's in conflict with my personal view, that these guys are, are trying to attack me or they're lying about me. And you know, the people in the trenches who work these jobs, they are quite concerned about it. They're quite concerned about the tone of the administration that wants to score points by doing things like bans on travel that don't have a practical effect that's useful. Because first of all, you're omitting from that, omitting from that list of banned countries. All the countries that have actually sent terrorists to their country to kill people. So that's problem A. And problem B, you're telling the Iraqis who are supposed to be on our side and fighting and dying with us, but telling them that because you're Iraqi and because we're suspicious of all Muslims, that you can't, we won't even consider letting you come to our country as a tourist, at least for the next 120 days. So it's just a very bad, you know, damaging message that's coming out uh, from this administration, which so is corrected. On Turkey, just very quickly, Turkey's been a one of the thorniest problems, I think, for the past administration. The first one is just the, the new ones just started to get into it, I think, a little bit. But it's a country that, without any doubt, played a role in, in the creation of this large jihadist militant community that we see in Syria now. They opened the floodgates, let them come in with, with full knowledge, thinking that we need anybody who can help us fight Assad. So if you're uh, going to help us defeat Assad, it doesn't matter. What your pedigree is and what you believe, you're, you're, you're allowed access. That's all the conduits for money and for weapons, uh, so everything came the lifeline of these jihadist groups, direct route from Turkey. Only recently have they been able to slow that, that flow down. I think now they've got their own serious ISIS problem they're dealing with, so there's, there's much more attention being paid to, to solutions and to stopping, um, you know, stopping them from at least getting stronger. But it's a bit late for that. I think it's they're, they're, they're going to be continued to be haunted by past decisions for some time to come, as our own world too. And then they have the privilege of being the last question. Um, last question. Um, I was mentioning our elections of last week in my opening remarks. I think one of, one of the defining uh, events of this election been uh, the refugee scheme in, in 2015. I think that's been happening ever since. One of the strong arguments from people against allowing too many refugees uh, in Europe is they said that there will be uh, ISIS members among them. How real is that threat? Well, we've seen it happen enough times that we know we can't just. That doesn't mean you shut off refugee flows. I mean, we've, we've had to deal with 
field a very serious crisis in the part of the world that you know, these you know, Billy, these refugee camps, I've talked to these people, they're not, these aren't economic refugees for the most part. These are people who are fl fleeing for their lives. Sometimes there's nothing but the clothes they have in them. So there are people who are in desperate shape and that all of us, the rest of the world, needs to collectively shoulder the responsibility of trying to find a solution for them. The ultimate solution being getting them a country to return to. And that's what we need to do. But there's also the question that ISIS has tried to take advantage of the fact that there's a human pipeline coming from the Middle East across the Balkans into Western Europe. If I remember the same from Bulu, the one that the guy from one of the terrorist attacks came through uh, a refugee. Yeah, we can see that. And we've seen other examples of that. And that's a very tough burden for law enforcement because a lot of these people have come over with no passports. There's no identifiers to show where they came from, and they have three passports. So we've essentially arrived through circumstances at a very difficult place, and the result of this refugee flow is, is that people are hugely afraid, and it's not completely unfounded. So it's, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it's, it's, I think it's the case. So to conclude, the woman I talked to in the bar is terrified of ISIS. Would you like to be terrified of ISIS? I think it's a human reaction to see the things that you see and be afraid. But because it's so random, that's the problem with ISIS. With Al Qaeda, it's some randomness there too, but it seems at least they had a strategic objective. They knew the kinds of targets they were going to go after. With the Islamic State, it could be a small college town in Ohio, as, as, as we saw in that killing a few weeks ago. So there's this randomness that just has to make you. I'm afraid as a, as a parent, for example, where, where are my kids going to be in an unsafe place? We also have to put things in perspective and realize that, at least in my country, hundreds and hundreds of times more people die from random gun shootings. In fact, I think I, think I saw a statistic, I'm not afraid about this, but more people have been killed in my country by dogs accidentally firing off guns <laughs> than, than, so by, yeah, than by dogs. <laughs> Legitimate acts of terror. It actually happens more than you think because there's so many guns in my country, so many hunters. A dog steps on the gun in the back of a truck, goes off, and somebody gets killed more often than you think. And so, when you put things in perspective, you see that yes, it's something that we should worry about, and think about, and as governments, we need to wrestle with very, very seriously. But the, the possibility that you're going to be killed in a terrorist attack is just vanishingly small. So, we, we should obsess on it. We do obsess on it. Did we end up, as they say, running the terrorist camp? I'm sure Martin will have closing remarks, but please give a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad I don't have a dog, uh, and I don't have a gun, actually. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, uh, you can all follow uh, all developments with uh, what's going on in the new in the Washington Post uh, with the work here. I uh, just want to quickly mention a few events that are coming up. Uh, we'll have uh, Michael Shaven, the novelist, on April 11th. We'll have the World Bank uh, head of research, uh, former head of research, uh, um, Branko Milanovic, on April 13th, talking about global inequality. We'll have uh, Adam Alter, NYU uh, professor Adam Alter, on April 20th on, uh, with his book uh, Irresistible on our uh, addiction to technology. And then on, April, on May 1st, um, we'll have an event on the first 100 days of President Trump with uh, political analyst uh, Thomas Frank. And Will England, who was actually mentioned just last night at the Bill Dreidor by Peter Beers, where he talked beautifully about his new book, uh, 1917. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our friends and family. I see plenty of you here tonight. Thank you for your support. I want to thank our sponsors, and maybe especially KLM, who donated uh, a painting for uh, Toby Warwick, which is very friendly of them. And uh, Chris, thank you for moderating, and uh, of course, thank you, Joey, for being here. And Joey will sign books over here. Thank you. See you next time.
with <laughs> Ik zeg niet, deed het. Ik zeg niet, deed het.